So the logic of the do loop, the statements come first, and then the expression is evaluated. That's why it's called a post-test. The test happens after the body. So do while loop notes. The loop always executes at least once and continues as long as the expression is true. Now, some languages have a do until, but not any that I teach. Do some stuff, right, until x is equal to 10, right? So as long as x is not equal to 10, it's going to repeat. But you can create that logic with our keywords while x is not equal to 10. Same thing. So you don't need a do until loop if you ever come across a programming language that does that. This says that it's useful in menu-driven programs to bring the user back to the menu to make another choice. Sure, you can implement a, a menu program as a do loop if you want. I think we pretty much have already established that you can, you can, um, you can do menu-based programs with a while loop as well. Because you can always code this any loop you want with a while loop if you're careful enough. The other loops just provide better syntax, specifically the for loop. This is the best syntax. For, and then you put your initialization, and then your test, and then your update. It all happens on one line. We have talked about for loops in this class, yes or no. So I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. So in general, you know, you have int is equal to i. I mean, int i, that's your loop control variable. Loop control variable. So we initialize there, and then we have a test condition. While i is less than or equal to 10, that's our test. And then we have something that we do with it, do something, that's our body. And then we have an update to it, plus plus i. i plus plus. So, a for loop. Puts all that stuff, oh, and this is called the update. For loop puts all that in one header. For, int i is equal to 1, that's the init. i is less than or equal to 10, that's the test. Plus plus i, that's the update. And then you just put the body in here. Like that. Just a better syntax. You use for loops if you're counting over a definite series. Right, you, you have a list of numbers and you know in advance what the numbers are going to look like. Or you have an array and you want to step through the array. The syntax is nice and clean. Uh, you know, we've shortened this from, if we uh, don't count the braces, then we have four lines of code. And if we don't count the braces here, we have two lines of code. Now, yeah, whoop -dee. We, we saved ourselves two lines of code. But the good part of it is, is we know what the update is just by looking at this, right? We don't have to scroll down to the bottom of the code to find out how i is going to be incremented. It's nice to have all of this in one place. And so the order of execution, this is a pre-test loop because this test has to pass before we go in here. If we initialize i to 100, 100 is not less than 10, so it's not going to do the body. And obviously that's your fault. I have no idea why you would write your code like that. But you can leave off various parts of the for loop if you want. You don't have to initialize your variable, in which case you just put a semicolon there. And you keep running while i is less than 10 plus plus i. You do something, whatever you're going to do. All right, cool. Well, what if you don't want to put the condition in it either? What if you decide you're going to have several different ways of getting out of the code? Like so, right, if, you know, i is equal to 10, you're going to break. If, you know, z is whatever z is, is equal to 20, then you're going to break, right? So fine. Now, by the time you've done this, you may have well used a while loop. There's no reason to use a for loop for that. But you'll see programmers do that just because they love for loops so so much that they'll, that's their hammer, so everything looks like a nail. And you can do anything with a for loop that you can with a while loop. There's one thing that a for loop can do that a while loop can't directly. And that's what's known as a for each. If you have an array, which we really haven't talked about, but you create an array, 
and it's got a series of values. If, if L is my array, then you could do this. For int L, n for colon, array, like that. And then you print L out. This copies the value of the array one by one into that variable. And it skips the need to use indices, indexes. Notice that there's no update, there's no I++, and there's no initializing of I to zero, and there's no place where we're loading up this variable L with a specific value of the array. It's being taken care of in that statement. Now, when we get two arrays, that will make sense. I'm going to delete it now. I just wanted to show it to you because that's kind of the one time that a for loop has a syntax that the while loop cannot duplicate. That doesn't mean that you can't write a loop to process an array with a while loop. You absolutely can. You just cannot do it with this exact syntax, with this point of the syntax where you're iterating through it with a variable and you declare that you know in one statement like that. All right. For each loop, we'll talk about in another chapter. That's a true statement. We haven't drilled in on arrays yet. Have we talked about arrays? All right, all right. Need to get there real soon. So for loop mechanics, as I mentioned, the initialization happens, the test happens. Then the statement happens, and then the update happens. Even though the update is listed up here in the header, it actually doesn't happen until the body is executed. It's just up here to make it nice and easy to use. So a closer look at lines 15 through whatever. Can they use a for loop? In any situation that clearly requires an initialization, a false condition to stop the loop, and an update. Anytime you have those three things, you can use a for loop for it. You could also use a while loop, right? But if you can write the syntax a little bit more cleanly with a for loop, go for it. So. When to use a do loop? If the loop of the body must be executed at least once, use a do loop. When to use a for loop? What I just said, I'm going to copy and paste it. Any situation that requires an initialization, a false condition to stop the loop, and an update to occur at the end of each iteration. Now, I showed you that you could leave some of those off, right? If you have a break statement in there, you don't have to put the condition. If you don't want to initialize it inside the, uh, the parentheses, you don't got to. But by the time you're doing that, you're kind of wasting the niceness that a for loop gives you. You ought to just have coded it in a while. And so lastly, when to use a while loop when the other two don't apply. some interesting stuff. If you want to, your initialization could be a little bit more complex. Here the initialization is updating two variables. And, oh this is cute. Look what it's calling this. Is this really the test expression? No, that's not a test expression. This stuff would need to be moved. You know, like that. This is the update. But, two things are being updated. So you can omit the initialization and expression if it's already been done elsewhere. You can do more than one initialization if you want. Now I'm not sure you can do int x equals 1, int y equals 1. Let's find out. Okay, int a 
take like 4, int a is equal to 0, int b is equal to 0, keep running while a is less than 10, and then we, as we go, a plus plus comma b plus plus. Let's see if that's good syntax. C out. A. Yep, it considered that good syntax as far as I can see. Did you have to do it that way? No, you could have initialized those two things before. But it's kind of neat to be able to put the syntax there. You don't separate the multiple initializations with semicolons because the semicolon marks the end of all initializations. It's like you don't separate these updates with a semicolon because this, this semicolon marks the beginning of all the updates and the end of the test condition. Now, can you put in multiple conditions? Can you say keep running while B is equal to 10? No, that is an error. It better tell me it's an error. I'm going to throw a fit if it seems to run. Error list. Okay. It failed. Which is good. Right? Because if you really wanted to do both things, what would you do? You'd just make an and there. Right? That's how you chain multiple conditions together with ands. I'm going to make that B is less than 10. All right, gang, I'd be interested if you all want to. Go ahead and pop open Visual Studio. Go ahead and create a file if you haven't already. And let's play with this idea. I'm going to create two variables. Int c is equal to 0, comma, int d is equal to 10. Now our test condition is going to be while c is less than 10. Our update is going to be c++, comma, d minus minus. And then in here, let's just print out those two values. c out a c, arrow, arrow, a space, in quote, arrow, arrow, a d, arrow, arrow, in d. And we'll see the numbers. What is this going to print? What's at the first iteration? What is it going to print? What is C equal during the first iteration? Zero. It's e equals zero and D equals ten, right? Mm -hmm. And then after it iterates, these things update, so C becomes what? One. And D lowers itself to nine, so it's going to print zero, ten, one, nine, two, eight, and so on. unless it fails. Type int unexpected. Now I guess when I said that that syntax was allowed, apparently it's not. So 0, 10, 1, 9, 2, 8, 3, 7, and so on. So this syntax works, but if you had to create more uh, than one type, like if you needed a float and an int, you need to just create the float above the loop. There's nothing wrong with declaring your variables outside of the for loop, right? I did not have to declare C and D in that loop. I easily could have done int C, comma D, and then in here I could have just done C is equal to 0, D is equal to 10, like that. The only advantage to declaring your loop control variables inside those parentheses is that frees those variables up to be redeclared later. Right, because now that I've done int c comma d, I can't have a string called d somewhere later in the code in that function. 
Now, why would you want a string that's a single letter name? Well, we're using single letter names, and so they're bad. But anyways, if you declare your loop control variable inside the parentheses, then by the time you're done with it, you should not be able to get to it. So I have this little loop here that y'all didn't necessarily type in because I hadn't told you to type in anything yet. But you see I declared my A variable here. Once the loop is done and I try to print A out, it won't print. Why is that? A doesn't exist anymore. A only exists from there to there. And it's nice to be able to cordon off your counters and things like that inside the for loop so that you can reuse those variables later for other purposes. So keeping a running total. To do that, you need an accumulator. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we've written this code. Have we not add up all the numbers between 1 and 10? No? Okay, okay. So, what you do is you declare your summation variable, your accumulator, and you declare it outside the loop. And then each iteration of the loop, you add it to that number. And then once the loop ends, then you can use that sum that you have calculated. And so, you know, it could be something where you entered a, a series of test scores, or in this case, we're just adding up a series of numbers. We don't even indicate what they are. In this particular case, we're adding up all the numbers between 1 and 10. We're doing a summation. So let's do a summation and then a factorial. Fact that may be the wrong term, but when you're doing 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 and so on. So, int sum is equal to zero. You've got to declare it outside your loop. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of loop you use to do a summation. You could use a while loop. You could use a for loop. Why not for loops? They're the most awesome. So, for int i is equal to one, there's no reason to add zero to it, right? So, I'm going to start my counter off at one. Keep running while i is less than or equal to 10. And then plus plus i. By the way, I don't recall if I've mentioned it, but that is marginally faster. It's a nanosecond faster than uh, doing I++. All righty, and then let's add I to sum. So sum equals sum plus I. Let's see, do the uh, better syntax, sum plus equals I. And then let's print out the sum. Equals I or That's a goof. I made a mistake there. What should that be? Uh, I. That should be I, right. Yeah. Okay. That's better. You said it. You just did it. Yeah, and that is the same as writing sum equals sum plus I. Those are just two different syntaxes. And so then there's the factorial, which is the exclamation mark key on your calculator, right? You type 10, you get the exclamation, and it multiplies 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to times 10. I think it would be fun to write a factorial, but put it inside another loop so that we can calculate the factorial of 2, the factorial of 3, the factorial of 4, and so on, and watch how quickly that number gets how fast it increases. So this is a nested loop. The outer loop is just going to count like from 1 to 10 or something like that, and then the inner loop is going to calculate the factorial. And we can do the same thing with the sum. The only thing that we would have to do here is we would not fix our counter to 10. We would make that a variable. Well, let's do that. I'm going to go up above my int sum is equal to 0. And I'm going to write a loop. For, it's giving me grief because uh, I'm messing up the spacing. Tell you what, take your entire code here and tab it over one. 
All right, so now, for int top is equal to 1, semicolon, top is less than or equal to 20, semicolon, top plus plus, or plus plus top. And then an open brace, and then a closed brace, and then put, instead of 10 there, change that to, word, to the word top. That's the top of our summation. And now we're going to modify our C out statement a little bit. I'm just going to delete it and completely retype it. C out summation of end quote space end quote arrow arrow top arrow arrow quote space is end quote arrow arrow sum arrow arrow NDL like that. I'm going to get rid, tired of that input statement very quickly. I'll, I'll bring the code back. But if we look at it, summation of 1 is 1, right? Because 1 plus nothing is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1, 2, and 3 add up to 6. 1, 2, 3, 4 is 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is 15, and so on. So we've used a nested loop. This is the loop control variable of our outer loop. Our inner loop has a loop control variable too, but we're not printing it out. I is our inner loop control variable but we're not printing it out. Instead, we're using its result as the sum. Uh, my assumption is that top is undefined. Do you have int in front of it? Yeah. Let me come look. Now we're going to do factorial. Factorial, instead of being 1 plus 2 plus 3, is 1 times 2 times 3, and so on. But factorials get huge very quickly. So we're not going to use an int to hold our factorial. We could use a long. We could use a long. Otherwise, the code's going to be the exact same as this stuff. I could just copy and paste it and make a few changes to it. I don't know if we learned as much doing that, but let's do it. So copy your entire stuff from the 4 int top equals 1 to that close brace after the summation print. And then print, I mean paste it, and we're just going to make a few changes. Now, if our factorial started at 0, 0 times 1 times 2, no matter how many numbers you multiply it by, it's always going to be zero, right? So instead, we're going to make this one. Let's give it a better name than sum because it's not the sum anymore. It's the product. And let's change that to a long one. And so down here where sum says sum equals sum plus, instead it needs to be product equals product times i or product times equals i. And then lastly, instead of saying summation of, make it say factorial, factorial of top is, and you've got to replace that word sum again with product. I think I remember using a factorial in the past to show you data overflow. 
if we increase the value of top to something, we hit the point where the uh, product went negative and then turned to zero. So instead of going to 20, how about 40? Yeah, yeah, but at a certain point it breaks, right? 20 worked, but 21 did not. By 21, we have exceeded the maximum capacity of a long, long. So we could change our product from a long, long to a double, and then it would be able to get much larger. I'm not going to figure out which point it, it fails. We've done that before. Well, it didn't happen at 100. How about 200? All right. Eventually, it breaks. At, a, at 170, it still worked, but at 171, we do data overflow. And instead of just printing a wrong answer, it is printing out infinite. It's got some special value stored away in that floating point type. Now, a cool thing to do would be to turn this loop into a function so that we can call it whatever we want. If we want to calculate a lot of factorials, it would be better to stick it in a function rather than have to copy this loop and paste it every time we want to calculate a factorial. scroll up and comment out my little input statement because it's driving me crazy. I just type that in every single time. All right, we good to go or do I need to leave typing time for anybody? So that's called a running total. You know, and the running total can be anything. You could be reading numbers in from a file. You could be asking the user for numbers. You know, how many times are you going to be calculating a summation of 1 to 10 or anything like that? Not very often. Never, really. But you're quite often going to be generating some data and then running through them to calculate the total of that series of, of pieces of data, whether, you know, generated by, you know, a machine or a sensor or random numbers. I don't know. So Sentinel values. We've talked about sentinel values. Sentinel values are the piece of data which would be invalid data, but it tells the loop to exit. Enter your test score, or negative 999 to quit. That negative 999 is a sentinel value. So it's the value in a list of values that indicates the end of data. So if you have some file out there, and inside the file was a series of numbers that were going to be added up. And one way you could say is, okay, if you ever hit a negative one, that means it's the end of the file. Now, really, do we need that kind of marker in it? No, because the end of file can be detected in other ways. But in that case, negative one would be the sentinel value in ending the series of numbers that were going to be added together, just like the period at the end of the sentence. An end of file marker can be considered a sentinel value. So, it's a special value that cannot be confused with valid data. Negative 999 for a test score. And used to terminate input when the user may not know how many values will be entered. Right? If uh, you're asking the user to enter 12 temperatures, one per month, then putting in a sentinel value is probably a mistake. You would want all 12 values to be filled in. But, if you don't know how many pieces of data they're entering, then, yeah, letting them enter a signal value to stop, it's a good idea. This is not the first time we've heard the term signal value. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Deciding which loop to use. The do loop is useful if you need something to iterate at least once. The while loop iterates as long as a certain condition exists. It 
can be used for validation input. It can read a list of data terminated by sentinel value. The for loop is a pretest loop. It's got built-in expressions for initializing, testing, and updating. And this says it's good when the exact number of iterations is known. I don't know if that's my definition of when you use it. But I would say you would use them when you're going to be iterating through a series of values. And that series of values could be sequential, like we're using I++, or they could be values in an array or a list or from a file. All of that, all of that kind of stuff. You're, you're running through a sequential list, a, a set, a series of values. So nested loops, I just did a nested loop. I did a nested loop that would, uh, you know, print out those products. Now we're going to print, we're going to write a nested loop that does something like this. And I hope we haven't done this already. 1 o'clock, 105, 110, 115, and so on. Or maybe we just go over every 15 minutes. 130, 145, 160. Except there is no 160. That's when it becomes 2 o'clock, right? And then 215, and then 230, and then 245, and so on. And we're going to implement that as a nested loop, and why not use a for loop? Because we know that we're going over a series of values, easily calculated. So, for int hour is equal to, I'm going to start it at noon, and I'm going to go until 6 o'clock. Int hour is equal to 12, hour less, wait. Int hour is equal to 1, hour is less than or equal to 6, hour plus equals 1, or excuse me, hour plus plus, or plus plus hour. Now inside it we need a minutes counter. For int minutes equals 0, minutes is less than 60, or less than or equal to 45, it doesn't matter, I'm going to make it less than 60, and then minutes plus equals 15. We're going to go up by 15 minutes each time. And inside that, we're going to print our stuff out. We're not going to bother formatting it nicely with mims and stuff like that. Be nice, but so C out, arrow, arrow, the hour, arrow, arrow, followed by a colon. So quote, colon, quote, arrow, arrow, and then the minutes. And I wish I'd made this uh, singular, but anyways, minutes followed by endl. All right, and it printed all the times between 1 o'clock and 6.45. Notice that the inner loop completed an entire cycle before the outer loop increased once, right? So it printed 15, 30, and 45, and then the outer loop variable incremented. The inner loop went again, 0, 15, 30, 45, and then the hour, outer was incremented. So the inner loop completes, com completes completely before the outer loop ever executes. Same thing as we were seeing with the summation. To calculate the summation, it had to go through an entire sequence of the in inner loop. And it wasn't until the inner loop was done that it could print the result and then iterate the outer loop again 